God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, Quincy High School. Today is Friday, September 25th, 1980, day three of the six-week cycle. We will now rise for the salute to our flag. And this is how I spent every morning at Quincy High School, <laughs> listening to the day's announcements that were broadcast all over the school to the students and faculty. It was a very strange time to be coming of age. And I think I would have been a very different person had I been born 10 years before or 10 years after 1963. And I want to tell you a little of it now because it's important to remember. It's important to tell the story. I'm not sure at what age I became aware of the political climate and the events of the world, but at about age 10, I was aware that the world was changing. In 1974, the Watergate scandal broke and an American president for the first time in memory was nearly impeached. That year, we were still doing air raid drills where our teachers would tell us to duck and cover under our desks to protect us in case of an atomic bomb attack. In 1975, the Vietnam War ended with the fall of Saigon. And the contrast between the country's support of World War II and the Vietnam War could not have been more stark. The first phase of court-ordered inter court integration of Boston's public schools happened that year. Boston's busing crisis caused rioting and caused my family to move out of Boston, not because my parents disagreed with the integration of schools, but because people were carrying guns and throwing rocks and tipping over school buses. In 1976, we celebrated the bicentennial, and the queen waved to me from her black limousine as her motorca motorcade drove through Crispus Attucks Square where we were standing to see her. In 1977, Gary Gilmore was executed by a firing squad in Utah after the reintroduction of the death penalty. And that year, Apple Computers was incorporated. In 1978, 918 members of the People's Temple, a religious cult originally from San Francisco, committed suicide in a remote jungle outpost in Guyana upon the orders of their leader, Jim Jones. A Congressman, Leo Ryan, was shot to death in the same incident. And on that Friday, September 25th, 1980, while I was sitting in social studies, Judge Sandra Day O'Connor took her place as the first female justice of the United States Supreme Court. In my sophomore and junior years of high school, I was part of an unusual team of specialists. Once or twice a month, six teenagers would board a school bus and go to a historic place, federal courthouse, the USS Constitution, the Battleship Massachusetts, the Bunker Hill Monument, the Steps of Old North Church. I was a member of what would be, come to be known as the Hostage Choir. While I was in high school, 52 Americans were held hostage in Iran for 444 days from 1979 to 1981 after a group of militants took over the American embassy in Tehran in support of the Iranian revolutions. And our school's response was to send this small group of teenagers dressed in gray slacks and navy blue sweaters with a big Q over our hearts and sing religious and patriotic songs and pray for the release of these hostages. My role was crucial. I carried the pitch pipe. I gave them their first notes. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. What's more American? God bless America. America the beautiful. None of these can be sung in public schools anymore. At these rallies, there were usually clergymen, politicians, television cameras, and crowds waving American flags. Because what do you do when faced with a crisis like that? While this was going on, there was a second energy crisis with gas rationing, and prices reached almost $1.25 a gallon. Imagine that. In 1981, I graduated from high school I drank two beers at Sully's and I went around the corner to the courthouse with my friend Chris and registered for the draft. 
because we had to. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Around this time, I started singing in the adult choir of the Hosneck Congregational Church under the direction of Arden T. Schofield of Blessed Memory. Arden was a kind and gentle soul, a gifted musician and teacher. However, every July 4th, every Memorial Day, Labor Day, every Thanksgiving Sunday, every Flag Day, every Veterans Day, we would sing all patriotic hymns and anthems, and Arden had composed an instrumental piece that he played at the end called The Patriotic Fantasy, which wove together all kinds of patriotic songs. On Memorial Day, there was often a 21-gun salute fired by the VFW outside the church with guns pointed at the Atherton House School across the street. <laughs> this did seem over the top to me, but it seemed right as rain to everyone else, meaning my elders, who came of age at a different time. And it wasn't until I attended Arden's funeral last spring that I fun fully understood his choices and his motivations. You see, Arden had been taken prisoner at the Battle of the Bulge and held at Black Orb, one of the Nazis' most infamous POW camps. Eisenhower came in and liberated the camp. Arden returned home weighing only 90 pounds and spent his entire life speaking to youth groups and high school assemblies and civic associations about his experiences there. Arden T. Schofield was a patriot, a patriot who told the stories of his war experiences and of his love for his country and for God. To him, it was important to remember. It was important for him to tell the story. It was not only the time, but the place where I came of age which shaped my thoughts. Back in the day, Quincy was a war economy town. It had one of the busiest shipyards in the country, as you know, turning out battleships and cruisers and all manner of boats of war. In fact, it was one of the few shipyards that was equipped to build a particular kind of superior gun turret. Almost daily, a bottle of champagne was smashed on the prow of a ship as it slid out of dry dock and off to win the war for the good guys. Dot Sparks, who sang alto in an Arden's choir, worked overnights as a riveter at the shipyard when she was a young war bride. Another church member ran the lunch counter there. <clears throat> there was a huge Navy and Coast Guard presence in Quincy Harbor, and it seemed like everybody, everybody was connected to and behind the war. I hadn't been born yet, but I grew up on these stories, and I think this sameness this patriotism helped hold our community in place while civil rights, women's rights, Reaganomics, and all the wars and rioting marched across our TV screens. We didn't have a lot of choices. We had five channels. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your hearts as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. For the last 20 years or so, I've worked in churches, and I've been carefully riding the wave of change about, in attitudes about worship, about the language that we use, the imagery for God, the liturgical art we use, how children are included, how communion is served. I know all the reasons not to celebrate things like Memorial Day in church, the arguments about preaching a sermon like this, that the militaristic language of hymns like Onward Christian Soldiers has fallen out of favor, that Memorial Day is a national, not a religious holiday. Fifteen years ago, in the church's attempt to be inclusive to everyone, America the Beautiful was published in the New Century Hymnal of the United Church of Christ with this verse. How beautiful two continents and islands in the sea, that dream of peace, nonviolence, all people living free. Americas, Americas, God grant that we may be a sisterhood and brotherhood from sea to shining sea. 
and I'm frustrated because of our tradition's tendency to skip over war stories in the Bible, to mention only the rainbow and the olive branch, not God's wrath in Noah's story, to avoid that chronically depressed guy named Job. I think it's doing our congregations and our children a disservice. It is the opposite of remembering. It's important to tell these stories. It's important to remember. Now, war is mentioned 220 times in the King James Version of the Bible. And shouldn't we, as pastors and as the church, tell some of these stories? Each minister, each church needs to decide the place of secular holidays and sacred worship. And as I prepare to enter ordained ministry, I have to think about this myself. And I want very much to do this well. I want to honor those voices which eschew militaristic language, which believe that separation and church of states means exclusion of both, or who come to worship God, not soldiers. But I can't, or I won't, because of who I am and where I came from. And I remember last year in seminary, Don Saliers, who's a visiting professor from Emory University, said that if you don't give people the opportunity to lament, to hear the Psalms, then worship is flawed and missing something crucial. We can't be happy and jumpy all the time. I remember that Estelle Laughlin, a Holocaust survivor, says, memory is what shapes us. Memory is what teaches us. We must understand that's where our redemption lies. It's important to tell the story. It's important to remember. Last year in the New York Times op-ed pages, David Brooks published a piece called The Life Report, asking people who were 70 years of age to write their life stories and submit them for publications on his blog. He wrote, I asked for this gift for two reasons. First, we have few formal moments of self-appraisal in our culture. Occasionally, on a big birthday, people will take a step back and try to form a complete picture of their lives, but we have no regular rite of passage prompting them to do so. More important, these essays will be useful to the young. Young people are educated in many ways, but they are given relatively little help in understanding how a life develops, how careers and families evolve, what are the common mistakes and the common blessings of modern adulthood? These essays will help them benefit from your experience. He says it's important to remember. It's important to tell the story. And so, in thinking about my own ministry and how I might preach on these important days, I choose to lift up those who died in service to our country, who gave their lives for a greater good. Today, we honor them by using their language and imagery. We remember the horrors of war while we fervently pray for peace. Fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. Amen. <clears throat>